And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Today we're talking about a game called Dakota. Now Dakota is what we might call your classic cowboy versus Indians game, but it's not really. It's more about the settlers versus the Native Americans, more passive, aggressive style. In other words, this is a Euro game where you're getting resources, but you're kind of battling everyone else for those resources, a bit of area control and such. But half the players are playing Native Americans, the other half are playing the settlers, and there's a bit of struggle and culture clash going on involved there, although the culture clash isn't as pronounced as I'm making it sound. You're just going for different things. But all this goes together to make a game. Let's take a look at it, and then we'll tell you if it's good or not. Here's the board of Dakota, which is basically just a giant resource board, and when you set up the game, you have different areas that you can go to, and you see the different resources that are possible at each area. Let's take a closer look at one of them. If you notice, this one here has three wood and two uh, deer. Now, when all five of those resources are gone, the second row will activate. So you can see that some rows, that really makes a big difference in, for example, down here, when all five fish are, go are, are gone, then another fish and four gold will activate. So if you want the gold, you're going to have to get rid of the fish from those spots. So players are going to set these up, and those other markers are just to show that those regions are not yet active. And as the game progresses, and once one area is complete, the next region will open up, and different regions will produce different things. At the beginning of the game, players are going to basically secretly decide whether they want to be the settlers or whether they want to be the Native Americans. And they will then put out in front of them a chart showing their side, depending on what they pick. Now, there has to be people from both sides. It doesn't necessarily have to be even, but there has to be folks from both sides. Now, there is an exchange cost for the two different sides. Look here, for example, the settlers. For the settlers, gold is worth six, while for the Native Americans, gold is only worth two. Wood is worth one for the Native Americans and worth one, so there it's the same. Buffalo is worth five for the Native Americans, but only two for the settlers. So the different resources are going to matter for different people. What players are going to do, uh, this is kind of like a worker placement game. They're going to have pawns in their color at the beginning of each round. And they're going to be placing those on the side of their choice. They're also going to be placing some neutrals of both colors, the lighter ones are the settlers, darker ones are the Native Americans. They'll also be placing neutrals if they want on different spots on the board as long as they put them on the correct place. So in, for example here, let's say this is the way that the the markers are placed over there on the side of the board. At the end of each round, yellow here, first we see which side wins. Here Native Americans win, so the other ones are automatically removed. And then we see which color has the most. Yellow is the only one that's there. But let's say there had been two oranges there on that side. Then the two oranges, since they are stronger, they would get the first pick of the resources that they want from that side. While yellow would only get second pick. Later on, you'll be able to bring stronger soldiers into battle. So if yellow had this here, that would be three to two. Now, if blue had been over here, it doesn't matter. There's still more, and the blue piece would be removed. So you need to win a side to get the resources. So players will then take the resources that they need. They can sell the resources and buy or trade and barter if they send some workers over here. And what you want to do is eventually be able to build the different things on your sheet. For example, here if I want to, I, uh, this is the settler side, I could build a saloon at the beginning of my turn. During the activation phase, the player gets one wealth point. So I get one dollar that I can spend and do things with. And, and money is important because you can buy things, you can buy points, you can buy more workers that you use that cost 12. And so you can see here for the settlers, they need a lot of wood and a lot of iron and a few horses to get going. While the Native Americans need a whole mixture of different resources to get their things working. And their things are different. Uh, like they have different totems here, which lets you place more resources onto the board. When you win one of these buildings, not win, I guess when you buy one of these buildings, you will 
take the piece that you have for it. It comes with a little plastic thing that keeps falling off, as you just saw. And you will place it on the appropriate thing on your, on your board. So here, let's say I bought the blacksmith. I'll place it here. Now, why it has to be in a stand? Why I couldn't just, you know, put the blacksmith on top and have the picture here faded out? I don't know. I guess so everyone else can see that you have it, but whatever. Anyway, that just adds to the production cost without much payoff, especially since they fall over all the time. But as the game progresses, players will be getting points, and you can see a point track here. From building each of those buildings, give you points, or you could be buying points. And the game will progress until a certain number of rounds is finished. And after that number of rounds, depending on the number of players, the game is over, and the person with the most points wins. Alrighty, well, so the, the production quality and the heft of the box is good. You know, except for those buildings that knock over. Why is that even in the game? But the, the different resource icons, the little tokens, it's good. I like the fact that the, there's there's two different things. You know, for some people, the the getting the horses is more important. For other people, getting the iron. I like the fact that there's this clash going on back and forth. I like the fact that, uh, you know, you got to get rid of the top row of resources. Sometimes to dig down and get the stuff that, that you really want. What I don't like is that the game, if you play it a couple times, starts feeling very samey. Some of the, I mean, there's only like six or seven different buildings to build. So you build them. You get it, you get the resources. It's all in how you outmaneuver everyone else, I suppose, and what you buy first. But when it comes down to it, it just doesn't have a real zing to it. It's okay. I didn't hate the game. But for me, at this point in time, that's really not a sign of approval since we played thousands of games. And a game that we just say, eh, not so bad, isn't something that we're going to keep in play. There's some good ideas here, good concepts. I like the theme. I like the struggle back and forth and how, you know, you, you can gang up on someone or stab your own teammate in the back. Not teammate per se, but it's kind of like a team. You know, you say, well... If you're going to go for that area and win it, I'm going to come in and grab a resource too, or I'm going to make sure you don't get anything. Using Placing the neutral people can be very interesting. And sometimes you take someone out at the peril of them retaliating and taking you out. Going last each turn is a very, very big advantage. But all this being said, like I said, it just leaves me with the eh, so eh, it's okay. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.